dental endoscope is, is basically a diagnostic tool. A dental endoscope shows you what is below the gum line that we can't see unless you go do flap surgery. Sometimes we hold on to those teeth. They really make the periodontal situation healthier. Um, they can then make a plan, you know, because a lot of people aren't prepared to take a tooth out right away. So it does give them more understanding and, and in some ways more options in that sense. I firmly believe the more you can get out of those pockets, the biofilm, uh, calculus, the more you can get out of there, the easier the body's going to have to heal that. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist, episode number 198. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. And I'm really curious how I'm closing my suitcase. I don't know if it's going to happen. It, well, there's a lot of stuff in there. But is it already expanded too? Yes, it is. Oh, yes. Of course. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we have um, about 40 minutes till we have to check out of this your room. So oh, we wow. Probably, I forgot about um, that. Make this a shorter one. Yeah. But um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Welcome to this little dental hygiene podcast that's growing like crazy. You guys are amazing for sharing and giving um, your friends or letting them know that there is more content to be out had out there. I was just told by a dentist on Facebook um, the other day that calculus is um, what causes perio. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I feel like we really need to educate the hygienists that can go out there and spread the word. Yeah, no, for sure. Oh. I, well, we're here at Dance by Serona. And thank you, by the way, for uh, sending us out here at Dance by Serona. Like, mm -hmm. this has been a really good um, event. It's uh, Dance by Serona World 2019. Mm -hmm. um, it, in this particular couple of courses that we've taken, it's been really nice that they've really highlighted the hygienist a lot. And, and they've mentioned multiple times. I think um, it was Joe was like saying how we spend 85% of the appointment with, with, the, uh, with the patient. Right. And how important, like, our role is. And yes, the doctors get a lot of the credit, mm -hmm. but really what we do is really important. And it's Absolutely. very nice to feel that and feel validated in our kind of yeah. profession. It's been nice to, to hear that from Emily Bogey and some of the other speakers here also really highlighting our profession and telling us what we're doing yeah. is super important. So that's been nice. I have felt the trend this year coming from some major companies of highlighting the hygienist. Right. Let's right. talk about our products for hygienists. Let's go in and engage the hygienist. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. About time, folks. But I think it's really nice. Um, and I really hope that hygienists start to come to these conferences that we really um, continue to learn and educate ourselves so that we we can be the advocates for our patients that they really do need so that we don't have people telling me that there's calculus that causes perio. Uh -huh. And I think there's a way too also that you need to work with your dentist to try and get it, get that supported. Um, Brittany and I were at lunch at, at one of the events and there was a team from Canada that we were sitting with. Mm -hmm. So it was a hygienist. I think there's three dental assistants and we asked them kind of like, Hey, how did you guys get here? And they like, that oh, our, our doctor sent us here. And so if you, I know that there's lots of tips. I know the RDH under one roof website has a lot of really cool tips of how to try and get your doctor to sponsor your travels. So maybe head over there and check that out. But if you ever need any um, any other advice, just reach out to one of us. We'd be more than happy to kind of help you pitch the idea to your to your dentist, doctor, owner, yeah, manager, whoever's in charge of the budget. And while we were here, there was the first annual today's RDH honor honors award honor awards, mm -hmm. um, and big congratulations to some well deserved awards given out last night to Mandy, Jennifer, and Deborah. Yeah. Really great stories. Um, definitely teared up on a few of them. I was like, oh, that's so cool. The things that they're doing. So chat, you can go to today's RDH. I think all their um, stuff is on that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to read about them and, um, you know, give them a high five, send them a congrats or something. And then if you know someone for next year's yep. awards, make sure you nominate them. One of the, uh, Deborah, one of the award winners, 
it was her daughter who was a hygienist who nominated oh, her for doing all those amazing yeah. things. Yeah. Tilly, the, was it Tilly the Tooth? <laughs> Tilly the Tooth, yeah. So, um, just the really good things. It's nice to be recognizing hygienist from fellow hygienists. Yeah. I think yeah. there was something like, yes, I understand that doctors give us some kudos and things like that, but I like when we support each other and when we... Well, Mandy's doctor is the one that... Nominated her. Yeah, nominated yeah. her, Dr. Patel, who sounds like... I wish we could clone Dr. Patel. So <laughs> amazing. if you guys are looking for a job, yeah. just find Dr. Patel <laughs> yeah. up in Wisconsin. Yeah. And I'm sure she'll want to hire you too. Uh, so um, today our episode is on the endoscope. And I'm not, and I said this on the podcast, but it's not the actual like endoscopy going down your throat kind of endoscope. It is around teeth in the sulcus. Very cool stuff. Um, we have... Um, Nicole Fortune and Francis Tryon on the podcast. Um, Lacey actually helped co-host with me on this one. Um, she uh, asked some really good questions too, and I really appreciate her coming on and doing that. And oh my gosh, the content was just really, really great. We did have some internet issues, so sorry the audio might not be as great this time as it usually is, but um, the content was just too good to not capture it and send it out to you guys. Um, I think you're going to find, um, I think everyone's going to want to um, save up some money and maybe buy their own endoscope after this. I feel like endoscope in general, if you're looking for a way to pitch it to your company, it, it might be, it's not impossible to do it for like a one doctor yeah. office, but if you can be the person yep. that does all the hard cases yep. or the cases that need maybe just a little extra attention mm -hmm. and you want to get yourself educated in it, this is the way to do it. Yeah. And it's also like job security and maybe you can make a little bit more money doing it okay, if you're right. specialized skill in this. I mean, I know that we have businesses now, but I'm not an entrepreneur by nature. I don't have a real proclivity in that world. But I think if I had known about this back in the days when I was only, you know, working clinical full time, I honestly might have gotten my own endoscope and been doing that. that hygienist because that kind of stuff, that more advanced instrumentation, advanced care is so cool. And they're using the glycine and urethritol powders with it. Yeah. And that is just so cool. Of course, I can't do lasers. You're so ridiculous, South Carolina, but you know. And maybe, That'll help them change their ways by calling them out on How ridiculous, podcasts. how antiquated, that's fine. And you no proclivity, which is also something that they probably won't understand anyway. Proclivity. Oh, that's not insulting at so all funny. either. So funny. Not insulting. Oh my gosh. Take that state representatives. <laughs> <laughs> state board. <laughs> Actually, I know people on the state board. Don't. I'm just kidding, guys. Like, we're friends. <laughs> we just changed the laws. The okay. End. The, the end. end. So enjoy this episode with Nicole and Francis. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So welcome listeners. Um, we are really excited about this podcast. I'm talking about technology. It's something that you may have heard us like briefly throw out, but we haven't really gone in depth. And so one, I'm going to introduce my guest co-host, Lacey Walker. You've heard her on the podcast. Welcome, Lacey. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yes, always. And Nicole Fortune, you've actually heard on the podcast, Lasers. And I do tell people to go listen to that all the time. I'm like, I'm not the girl. Go listen to Nicole. So welcome back. Thank you. Awesome. And Francis Tryon. Tryon? Am I saying that right? No, you got okay. it right. Yep. And you've listened long enough to know that I butcher last names. So thank you for coming on. Sure. Sure. Love your podcast. I know you're always such a great fan of it. And so we appreciate the support and we appreciate you guys coming on today. And we're going to talk about endoscopes and not the ones for endoscopies going down your throat, looking in your belly, dental endoscopy, uh, endoscopes. So let's, let's get into it. Who wants to take this on first? Um, I'll start. Uh, Nicole's going to jump in every now and then, but I'm going to turn it over to Nicole later because she's the expert on using it with periimplantitis, which to me is huge. But, um, you know, back about mm, five years ago, the ADA came out with 
a thing that said, a statement, I shouldn't say a thing, a statement that says that current evidence suggests that therapies intended to arrest and control periodontal disease depends on effective root debridement. And it didn't tell us how to effectively root debride, but in order to control and arrest periodontal disease, that is our number one thing, is to effectively root debride. And studies show that um, we leave 30 to 40% behind. So we're obviously not effectively root debriding. So I'm going to tell you a little story. There is a desk in uh, the Palace of Versailles, the king uh, Louis XV had made. And this desk took nine years to make. He wanted a desk that nobody could break into, nobody could destroy, all the drawers locked with one mechanism. And uh, that's when they were, uh, the revolutionary guys were coming into the palace, destroying everything. They couldn't destroy this desk. So the desk is made out of iron. And that's not the, that's not the main thing I'm bringing up, but, but it is made out of iron. So it never got moved. And it's one of the original pieces, but there was only one key to unlock this deck. And King Louis wore this key around his neck all the time. So to me, an endoscope is that key that we as clinicians have been looking for to unlock all those mysteries down in those periodontal pockets that we just didn't know how to get to. We, we had no idea. So what is an endoscope, a dental endoscope? Uh, you know, I've never really seen a medical endoscope, luckily, knock on wood. So I don't know how it's different, but I just know a dental endoscope is, is basically a diagnostic tool. A dental endoscope shows you what is below the gum line that we can't see unless you go do flap surgery. So this is to help us not have to do flap surgery all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't remove flap surgery in every case, but in many cases. So you can see down in there, you can remove it. The beauty of using an endoscope is your body can now heal the problems we have going on, okay? Um, so we like to use the term visual scaling and root planing because traditionally you can't see. So that's kind of a, you know, that's something we learn in school and it's really important to still learn that, the feeling that, the, you know, that type of a thing, that, that tactile. But if you can visually see it, it, it just is a whole new world. I know it's opened a whole new world for me. I'm sure it's opened a whole new world for Nicole and many other users out there. So a lot of times you'll hear us refer to it as visual scaling and root planning. Okay, so let me let me tell you a little history about the dental endoscope. It's not new. It's been around since about the late 1990s. It came. It was started by a company called Dental View. And Dental View um, came out with this endoscope that, um, you know, the theory behind it was wonderful, but the delivery of it wasn't quite so wonderful. So on the screen, on the original Dental Endoscope, it came in, in kind of grays and blacks. It's kind, it was kind of like looking at a um, sonogram that people bring you and show you, here's my baby, and you look at it and you go... I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> and that thing, that thing is your baby? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what it was like looking through the old dental endoscope, the original dental endoscope. So it took it took me a lot, at least 12 patients to really know what I was looking at, what I was seeing, what I was removing. It took a while. The other issue with it was the water delivery system was terrible. It was just a drip. And you've got to keep that that fiber open, those fiber optics down in that pocket. You have to keep that clear so you can see what you're doing. It was terrible. And so needless to say, the company went under. And uh, Dr. Kwan uh, in California 
bought the company and he added uh, a water delivery system to it, which made all the difference in the world. So, but that was the only thing out there for years. So about 2013, Dr. Kwan came out with a new endoscope and it had better graphics. I mean, it, it, the graphics on it were very, very nice. So they still are very, very nice. So he came out with that. And then in 2018, a company called Oraview came out with a new endoscope that is run off of Microsoft Surface tablet. So you can now uh, take pictures and videos down in the pocket as you're using it. You can adjust the light, the water. So there's a lot of advantages. But both the endoscopes do a beautiful, a beautiful job as far as training, as far as being able to see to train. I think now it probably takes a person one to two patients to really know what you're seeing. Now, now learning how to use it might take a little bit longer, but being able to see and go, wow, I can see that calculus. I can see that biofilm. I can see decay under a cramp. I can see that. I can recognize it. I can um, remove it. So that's kind of the history. So it's really not new technology. It's just a better technology now. I'm curious. Um you you just said you could see decay and biofilm. One thing that always got me, and now I'm like, oh, that would have been a good uh, use of it, is external resorption. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm I'm cool. <laughs> okay, good because I was cursed with giving that knowledge of that information to people. I had probably one a month with external resorption. Isn't that insane? Wow, that is insane. Yeah, it, and I, you can see it even when you don't expect it. Not just external resorption, but also uh, recurrent decay around a crown margin. And when I start to see that with the endoscope, there's a lot of things that happen. First of all, you can show it to the patient, and it's magnified. The view is not a one-to-one -one scale. It's magnified at least 50% and even up to 100%. So it's huge. It's this big hole on the screen that you can see. Um, so patients, first of all, patients get it, right? Because I understand it doesn't hurt. It doesn't seem like there's a problem. We're telling them it's a problem. Um, right. So they, they understand that and they, they move forward. Um, it, the one problem I had in the beginning is I was telling some, it wasn't with resorption, that's pretty obvious, tooth's gotta go, but with recurrent decay around a crown margin that wasn't, per they couldn't feel it and they couldn't see the amount of fill. So I would have, I work in perio and I would send my report over and say there's recurrent decay on this surface. And some doctors would say, well, what do you want me to do? Because I can't, I can't tell that it's there. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. So, well, just knowing that it's there is certainly a good start. Uh, but I started taking, you know, it's nice to, it will, taking a picture of it, trying to send something to them, point out, visiting them, saying, this is what I see and this is where it is, so that they can get in there and try and hold on to that tooth for the patient. Um, fractures, I've seen um, plenty of fractures. And, you know, again, it's, it's patient education. It's just amazing. You know, they, they, they see it, they understand, they, they know what needs to happen next. And fortunately, again, I work in perio, so if we do need to take that tooth out and they're numb already, um, I could just change course and we can take care of, of it that day. Uh, I, I agree with Nicole, because to me, fractures in the tooth is like a black hole of dentistry. You know, oh, what gosh, yeah. do you have if you can't see it? You know, do you put a crown on it? Do you do a root canal? Do you have to do, what do you do? If you could take a diagnostic tool, look down there and see it, how much better would that be for the patient and, and everybody? You'd have a better implant. No, oh, I agree. I can't always see fractures, but if they're big enough, you can. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And you can see how far they go. You know, yeah. Sometimes we're going to put a crown on this, but I can't really tell how far it goes. And if it's, yeah, you know, but we can see. We can say, well, this is extending, you know, 
so far. And some of those uh, decisions, you know, it's, it's only extending a few millimeters under uh, sub G that's not going to be covered by the crown or isn't covered by the existing crown. It, sometimes we hold on to those teeth. If we make the periodontal situation healthier, um, they can then make a plan, you know, because a lot of people aren't prepared to take a tooth out right away. So it does give them more understanding and, and in some ways more options in that sense. I agree. It's not an emergency. Yeah. Uh, um, let me kind of tell you how to use an endoscope. So That's a good you start. Using both, <laughs> you're using both hands. So in one hand, which I'm right-handed, I would have the endoscope in my left hand, and I would have an ultrasonic in the right hand. Now, I... I would say 99% of the clinicians use an ultrasonic, whether it's a piezo or cavitron. You can use uh, a hand scaler. It just for me, it's more efficient because I'm really then I've got two water sources to keep the blood down to keep you know to keep the vision down. And you know, people think that that's the difficult part of doing this, and it isn't because how often. Do you use a, a mouth mirror in your left hand or a suction in your left hand? We are used to using our left hand. So that's not the difficult part. The next part is you're looking up at a monitor. You're not looking down in the mouth. You're looking at a monitor. Now, to me, that's a little bit more difficult because for me, the hardest part is that you are using two feet pedals. So one oh, okay. <laughs> on the water to the ultrasonic and one goes on the water to the endoscope. And I guarantee you, you're going to spray that patient <laughs> because you're focused on that monitor and you're going to pull the wrong one out sometime. So I always apologize ahead of time to my patient and I always have a towel too. So um, I don't know, Nicole, if you have, if you're as bad as oh, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I have towels. I have uh, one around the patient's neck, and then I have some on reserve because I know that one's <laughs> going to be done and toast. <laughs> so that's the hardest part for, I think, yeah. with the new uh, graphics and stuff, that the recognizing that, all of that, that's not the hard part. The other hard, that's the other part. Um, I wanted to touch on biofilm because you guys are all big biofilm people. And more about it than I do, but I have to tell you my first experience seeing biofilm, and I don't, I don't always see it, but I was in a patient, one of my first patients I did, and I put the endoscope down there and it was, it was like, it was so foggy. I couldn't see anything. And I thought there was something wrong with my endoscope and my, my, uh, Trainer goes, nope, just keep using your uh, ultrasonic in that pocket. Just keep using it, keep using it, keep using I mean, I thought I was down there like an hour. I, I really wasn't, but it felt like a long time. And then it just lifted. And I said, what is that? She said, that was biofilm in black. So what I learned from it and what I try and teach my students is that biofilm is so sticky that it doesn't take two seconds of your ultrasonic to remove it. And it's so critical that we remove it. And so to me, that's where the, the airflow therapy, the, the biofilm natural, all those terms we're using now comes into play because it's huge. We've got to get that biofilm out, not only so that we can see with the endoscope, but so the body can heal better but um, I know I know both Michelle and, and Nicole talk a lot on vinyl film so you probably have more to say on it I just know it, it doesn't it doesn't get a lot of uh, attention because a lot of times we can't see it but it's there because we have seen it I think this might be my favorite thing um, right now is like hearing you having that learning experience and I'm almost jealous of it <laughs> because what a great moment to really like let that light bulb go off. Like you hear it, you we've heard those studies that talk about, you know, using the ultrasonic for like 30 to 60 seconds minimum in that pocket. But when you apply that, you're like, Pfft who's got time for that but if you really see how difficult it is you're more likely to apply that right so I love that you shared that with us 
Yeah, it's definitely an important piece. Time, you know, biofilm, it's, it, it, it's so tenacious. And if you if it loosens from the implant or the tooth, then it's actually, you see, it's actually connected to the soft tissue over here. So it's complex. Wow. It takes, it takes time. Um, that and, of course, calculus removal is just like, that's my biggest recommendation for people who don't have an endoscope. Just slow down. Whatever speed you're at right now, slow down because it's not enough. I totally agree. I always tell my students, if you think you're done, go back to another time because you're not done. <laughs> you're not done. Um, so I wanted to touch on a little a little bit about why would you want, why would you even want to use an endoscope? What are the, what are the benefits of it? And the ones that I have seen are things like, you know, I, I'm not cutting tissue, so I'm not having recession issues. I'm not having, um, you know, I'm not having my patient have to come back for uh, packing or suture removal. It takes a lot of time uh, in the dental office. I'm sure Nicole can, can talk more on that. But probably the biggest thing for me right now is the pain management. You know, we hear this opioid stuff all the time. You know, I tell my patients, go home. Take whatever you take for a, a a little headache, and that's it. You don't have to do anything. Hopefully, they are not taking an opioid for a headache, but um, <laughs> yeah. it's simple, simple pain management. It, and to me, in our day and age, that's huge. It, it, it is huge. And, of course, I firmly believe the more you can get out of those pockets, the biofilm, the uh, calculus, the more you can get out of there, the easier the body's going to have to heal that. Um, when I was in school, worked on dinosaurs, not really, but when I was in school, we were told once the bone was gone, the bone was gone. And I, yeah. I, I always mm -hmm. wondered about that. It didn't make sense to me because I could break my arm and my bone healed. So why would it not heal in the mouth? And this is theory according to Francis. This is not scientific. This is just my theory. Because we could not remove all the biofilm, we couldn't remove all the calculus. So the body is still fighting all of the toxins and couldn't kill itself. We get them out. Nicole can tell you the same thing. We see it over and over where the body starts to rebuild bone. So uh, you want to add a little That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing, these surgery-like results without surgery. Um, you know, the root canal gets picked on all the time as the, the, the dental, the big dental phobia procedure. Um, but right. studies, actual <laughs> studies show it's periodontal surgery. Patients just do not want their gums cut. Right. Um, and who does? Really, who does? Um, and it's it, it's tried and true and it does work. Periodontal surgery has been used over and over again. But um, patients want more options, minimally invasive and predictable. And I, I don't we don't always regenerate bone or re mineralize bone, but it does happen. And uh, even if it if it doesn't, the um, the, the pocket depths resolve amazingly my doctor if he were to do a surgery on a 10 millimeter pocket he would consider five or less being a, a success he wants to cut that deep pocket in half and i can make a, a, a 10 to a two so you know i'm surpassing what his expectations for surgery are and and people do they, they're looking for it they want it they do they do. I, I was amazed how many people sought me out because it's a great tool for a dental office to to be able to say we offer dental endoscope. We offer a minimally invasive type of surgery. So I shouldn't call it surgery. A minimally invasive type of treatment for periodontal disease. So um, no, it's a great. Go ahead. I, I'm just like, yeah, I was like raising my hand like a good student here. I was, I think this is a brilliant way for hygienists to market themselves, right? Like you can do this 
and maybe we are all like burned out. I don't know, just my like wheels are spinning of like how a hygienist could take the time to go get the education, maybe even lease or purchase the equipment themselves, lease it back to the office. Like you could really make this something and become the expert like you two have and market yourself that you are the expert in this. I mean, is that kind of what you're doing? It, it's definitely a possibility for someone to do that. And to, to take it and really, really run with it, you could work in, you could do what other specialists are doing, right? That don't want yeah. to practice. They're actually working um, in different uh, offices at different times. You could um, set up the, the gatekeeper of your own schedule and, and set up your, your own schedule, different offices to allow them to offer something different and something new uh, to their patients. It's And that's really what it is. We've had the same options over and over and over again for so many years and now we have something that's modern that's that's new that it's new but in an exciting way it's predictable yeah. um so it's it's absolutely something that you can do to breathe new life into your your practice and for those offices that are looking for a competitive advantage over the guy next door it's something that um, it's something that can really set them apart. So you're saying you could go into these different offices. So Francis, tell us how mobile this is. So let me tell you a little bit how I got started. Was I had read about uh, hygienists using it in RDH magazine, and this was probably ten years ago. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is wonderful! I have got to see this. And I called her and said, can I come walk you? And she said, yes. So I flew up to where she was, watched her perform this uh, endoscopic procedure for periodontal therapy. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, I have got to have one of those. So I went home, <laughs> talked my husband into letting me buy one. <laughs> and uh, then I went to the doctor I was working for. And at the time, I lived in Colorado. And so there's a lot more things we can do there that in, in, than we can in some other states. And I said, I'd like to uh, use that last operatory and um, offer endoscope to your patients, other hygienist patients, you know, kind of my own independent practice, in your practice. And, uh, Kind of thought about it for a while, and he came back and goes, you know, that's a good idea. Uh, I like it because I can use it to advertise in my office that we have this, that you can offer the service to other people. And so, then I had to find one to buy, and I had to find someone to train me. But I have never looked back. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And I do now, I don't live in Colorado anymore, but I do use it in several and I can pack it up. I can go. I do work once or twice a month in a perio office. I go in and scope his patients. Uh, I have an office, another office that I go into, a general dentist office, that I go into and scope their patients. So um, as a hygienist out there, it's just another avenue we can, we can do. I know there are several other hygienists out there that have their own scopes that do go to three or four different offices in in their town or in their area. So it's definitely service that we can offer to, and, not, and you may have to find out what the laws in your area are as to what you can and can't do. But I know there's doctors out there that would be so excited if we would do something like this. I do have a question. How long is the training for something like this? <laughs> And you can cut it out later. <laughs> I work for, I, I work for Orview. So the training on it is one whole day. Uh, I don't know what uh, Zest, who has the other one, I don't know how long theirs is. They trained you, Nicole. They, they did. It was one day, um, one full day, two patients. Yes. One day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that and are they anesthetized the first time? <laughs> Oh, God, yes. <laughs> now, Francis, though, how many patient people are trained at a time, though? I think Oroview has a different take on training in that it's a little bit more 
individualized? We do. So, so we like to, and we've tried it both ways. We tried training several people at once. And we just feel like you just don't get the training you need and the confidence you need. You know, anytime you're picking up something new, you need that confidence that you can do it. And so we do one-on-one training. To piggyback off of Lacey's question, like how, I know everyone is different. Lacey and I, if we were training, we would probably learn at different rates. But can you say how many patients when people are like, all right, I got this. I know we're going to screw up the foot pedal because I still to this day hit the air powder when I need to be, it's, I'm a mess. So that I can almost guarantee would happen all the time. But for me to identify, to get down in there, to actually remove, like, are you, what are you like 10 patients or is it, is that how it works? Kind of? uh, no, I think nowadays, it, I mean, I can't believe how many people I go in, the first patient, the, the first time, they go right in there, and it takes them about two teeth, and they know what they're looking at. Because the graphics wow. of both of these units are so good. But to truly feel confident in it, it, it probably would take you probably five, do you think? Nicole, what do you think? Yeah, you know, five to maybe even 10, depending on the degree. I mean, I started with, you know, eight, nine, 10 plus millimeter pockets. So the, those are heavy bleeders and there's a lot there. So uh, depending on what the uh, patient presents with, it took me about, I would say somewhere around eight to 10 patients before I felt like it was smooth. I didn't have to look down anymore. Like I had everything coordinated and set up appropriately so that I was not taking any more time than I normally would with that with that patient. So that, that is the point. When you first start, it will take you longer to do this than it would do traditional. Because again, you were figuring everything out. Once you have it down, it takes you the same amount of time, if not less. Mainly because you're not going back in. Did I get it all? Chip with an explorer, go back in, burnish it a little bit more, you know, <laughs> you're not doing that anymore. You're looking, you see it, you move on. Right. Oh, right. so, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole because the, the most amazing thing is around implants, I think. Implants is one of these, another black hole in dentistry that when somebody comes in with peri-implantized, we really don't have a definitive way to treat that. Right. But the endoscope is just amazing there. So, uh, Nicole, tell us. Yeah, well, um, the endoscope, I feel like, is, is wonderful around teeth, but it's um, it's a, a requirement if you're going to do implant dentistry, uh, especially if you are restoring implants and maintaining them. Uh, when we have um, someone that comes in with peri-implantitis, Francis is correct, um, there is no one accepted treatment plan that everyone does to try and correct that. Um, Peri-implantitis, as we know, is rapidly forming. Once it takes hold, it's difficult to eliminate. It's difficult to predict whether or not your work will actually work. And we know that those lesions are much bigger and it's much more of an inflammatory response. It's a sicker area. Uh, So many times what ends up happening is that these patients, even if they're presenting with you know, 20, less than 25% bone loss, kind of like an early stage, are going to be placed right into an aggressive surgery. Uh, when I say aggressive surgery, I'm talking about a kitchen sink surgery. We're going to cut the tissue. We're going to use the airflow, even though it's not uh, approved for surgery. We're going to use lasers and medicines and everything in bone grafting and uh, all sorts of stuff because we want to throw everything we have at it because we don't know what really truly is the, the key. And we're going to suture things up. Um, and that it works. It works. It works for, for, pe- uh, for many, many surgeons, um, no matter what their, uh, their own personal recipe is. But there are some cases that it doesn't make sense or cutting into the soft tissue really isn't the ideal option. If we're talking about an anesthetic area where we're going to have some tissue shrinkage or when we make that incision, we're going to destroy that papilla and everything's going to to expose that metal. The last thing we want to do is is create that. What if we don't have any 
keratinized tissue left there. I know that a lot of it, it's kind of accepted that two millimeters, at least a nice, thick, hard, healthy keratinized tissue is ideal around implants to help create that protective seal. What if we don't have that? Um, around that area. What if this um, What if this patient is immune compromised and they're an uncontrolled diabetic? We don't really want to go in there surgically because we could be making things worse because their body's working against them because they're uncontrolled. There are so many different reasons. And it's, I understand the concept of going in and treating implants aggressively, even if they're showing minimal amounts of bone loss or no bone loss yet. Uh, however, I feel it's in the patient's best interest if we can find a way to treat that in a minimally invasive manner and help protect what they have, their native uh, bone and soft tissue there. So when I'm using it around dental implants, there's a, there are many things that I see. Uh, one, of course, is residual cement. And many times the cement, you know, doesn't always show up on the film, especially if it's buccal or lingual, or if that, uh, that doctor has taken that time to try and remove it. So they've scraped it down so it's conformed to the implant body and it's not sticking out like a, like a little barnacle. We're not going to see that. Um, and it's very difficult to remove. Many times when we're in there blindly, you know, we could be instrumenting, and I've done this myself in the past, where I'm instrumenting for several minutes. This is before an end, uh, the endoscope came along, and I take my my post film thinking to, to verify I've got all this cement off, and it looks like I did nothing. So yeah, it's that, it's removing that, stopping that excessive instrumentation that's unnecessary. Everything that we put up against that implant body is going to alter the surface somehow. Amen, sister. <laughs> so our job is to find um, the the tool that will do the least amount of harm, but get, gets us the maximum amount of benefit to the patient. So the cement issue is is huge uh, because it doesn't come off easily, and I've noticed that while I'm watching myself take it off. And there is calculus on implants. There, it does happen. Yes, yeah. there is. There are micro gaps. There are crowns that are not seated completely or have a rough edge, and floss is getting stuck on that. So there are other circumstances that are fairly unique to dental implants that the endoscope really helps you diagnose and it helps you to treat. One thing Francis didn't mention, but one of the things I like to do is to turn that camera around. And we're going to look at that soft tissue now. So I've gone Ooh. in, aha, uh -huh. I've removed that cement um, off of that implant, and those particles have gone everywhere. Uh, and Dr. Tom Wilson showed us with his um, review that the lesions uh, of that peri-implantitis trap those biofilm-coated pieces of, of, of titanium or calcium. I was going to say, titanium is in there. Mm -hmm. And so we can see, it reflects back to you. You can see that cement, you can see particles of titanium, and then you can uh, make the appropriate decisions about what you're going to do about the soft tissue. And that, that depends, of course, on your state laws uh, about whether or not you can curatage the big C. Uh, but your doctor, <laughs> you know, your doctor can, you know, it, it, anywhere you are. So you can always um, have her or him come in and do that for you. Uh, it's a more in-depth look. You know, we talk about magnification. I mean, my loops are 3.0. I think my doctor's loops are 7, maybe. I, I don't know. They're long. Oh, but, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> microscopes are 22 times, right? And now we're talking about an endoscope, which is anywhere from 40 to 100% magnification. You can't get that with any other tools that we have. So the detail work and making sure that we have um, decontaminated that implant and that soft tissue to the best of our ability, we can't guarantee that with anything else. No, and I don't know if people do that. Uh, talk you said, or if it was something else, but I did not realize once you remove that implant and replace it, it's only got, I mean, it's so minimal that it will stay in there. The second one. Well, it's a, it, it is that. I got that from uh, Dr. Fromm. 
uh, I can't remember which one, but uh, published uh, <laughs> if it's the same, one of the Fromms, uh, the same surgical site, you know, that first implant has a, uh, a chance of survival in the high 90s. If we remove that and replace it with another one, the second one has a uh, sur uh, survival rate in the 70% category or range. The third one, if you want to even do it one more time, is 60%. So that's the that's the the issue with do we take it out and start fresh, or do we try to treat the periaphlatitis and maintain that implant? And you do have a better chance of keeping that implant in place if you can treat it appropriately rather than removing it and starting with this area that has been further uh, abused, you know, and damaged. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean the patient spent so much money so much money these are not these are not inexpensive and a lot of these patients are not spring chickens and so to put them through like you say these flap surgeries and things like that wouldn't it be so much better to perform something so non-invasive compared let's to think about, if you take surgery. it one step further so let's think about this when we place that crown you know, there are some people that are recommending a flap at the time of crown placement and crown delivery to make sure you got the cement off. So I always wonder, like, how that comes around when the patient's sitting there ready oh. for their crown. Now we're going to get a 15 out. We're going to cut that open. I mean, we're still just seems really crazy to me. Unnecessary. Through. But if you have an endoscope, right, you can remove as much cement as you think and you think it's cleaning then you get that endoscope in there and you put that camera in there and you will see if there's anything that's left behind and you can remove that while that soft tissue and that bone is still healthy it's prevention so is it easier to insert the endoscope in a deep pocket or a shallow pocket or is it all kind of just relative like because sometimes that tissue around an implant, especially a new one, is it's really tight. And so I was just curious, like, is it, do you find it easier? I think it depends on the patient, don't you, Francis? Yeah. Every situation is different. One, this five millimeter might be a little different than that five millimeter. So I find that things tend to loosen up <laughs> while I'm in there. But sometimes you have to kind of ask for permission to get in there with the tissue and start um, by um, slipping in as far as you can, doing some work and trying to scoot yourself down to the base of that pocket. So if it's tight, tight coronal tissue, you are going to get a little resistance there. I'm wondering if that has something to do with any kind of biotype. Probably. That thick heart. That's so, yeah, that thicker biotype. But that's a good point to make that not all five millimeter pockets are created the same. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There are some adjunct therapies that we use with or can be used with uh, the endoscope. Uh, one product that both of us use is Endogame. And in the game, oh, yeah. yes, the mammal matrix protein. So it helps the body to rebuild that bone, those sharp fibers, all of that. It works wonderful for that. And then I know Nicole uses a laser afterwards, also, I think afterwards, but her doctor also uses Lanap and she uses the endoscope with Lanap too. And I've seen that in quite a few burial offices. So, um, how do you, I mean, do you always use uh, a uh, laser after? If you I, do, I, so I do. Normal I, yeah, <laughs> I do. I always use the laser at the very end because I have, you know, I have it at my disposal, so I certainly can use it. Um, I, I do like to use it in the beginning. That light just helps to penetrate um and give me a nice little disinfection before I start going in and stirring things up. Um, it also helps to relax the tissue a bit, that thermal relaxation. So if I had that tight thing, but also just going back to the, how tight the pocket is, the endoscope is only the size of a few human hairs, you know, so it's a very oh, tiny, thanks. tiny, it's not, we're not talking like a video scope end, which was this big round funky thing. But yes, I do use a laser at the end because I like to, um, if I'm using M to gain, uh, I like to take the laser and, and force a blood clot right along the, the gum line around the gingival margin. And that's my, that's my barrier to keep the M to gain in. That's my, that's my suture basically. Oh, that's yeah. Correct. 
that's a that's a really <laughs> how do you use that? Um, so how do you use it with Lanap in your office? So the thing with Lanap is that we always knew that Lanap. We've been a Lanap office for about fifteen years. So we've been we've been doing it for a long time. And we always, my doctor would even present it this way and tell the patient, we know we'll make things better, but I can't guarantee you to what degree. And so we really only, and we started to only uh, reserve it for people like that general horizontal bone loss where you're really just holding on to the teeth as long as you can because um, flap surgery wasn't going to be all that beneficial for these patients. And I firmly believe it's because we weren't debriding well enough because now we incorporate the camera and we, I can guarantee you that we're going to, we're going to fix this. And that those are the cases where I get a lot of bone uh, repair as well. So it's better for the patients. My doctor feels more confident. Plus it actually is a good business model for him because that patient's in my chair being charged doctor, yeah. the Lanap salary. Dr. Waxen does his beginning piece with the laser laser. He leaves. I do all the debridement. He's got his other three operatories he's generating revenue from. And then he comes in at the end and finishes it in my room. So it's it just get, it makes my operatory more profitable to him. Sure. Sure. Because, and I think the thing that people get confused is that Lanap's not necessarily a procedure, it's a tool within that code that you are using. Is that correct? Is that a good way of defining it? Lanap is a, it's a, 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 it is a procedure, it's a sequence of events that you go through. Yes, yes, yes. It's a protocol or a recipe um, that you follow, and if you follow it to the letter, you may call it Lanap. Um, and that's, and that's what, and we use a specific laser for that, that comes from, um, a specific company that coined and, and owns that, that term. Mm -hmm. I should maybe clarify. It's not a procedure, like you could call it, like you're charging out for perio surgery. Correct. And that's only because it's, it is a tool that is going to generate health, just like the surgery. So it's, it's like your scalpel. It's like... Your right. it's a, it's, sutures, whatever. It's it's a way to do periodontal surgery without having to lay a flap. Exactly, that's great. So I have a few questions that came up, like as I was hearing you. My first question is, what do you do for suction with the two <laughs> foot pedals and water? <laughs> what? <laughs> Are they, are they like, um, I watched Little Shop of Horrors on a flight the other day. <laughs> the patient's just like gurgling out water. That's what I'm picturing. <laughs> I don't work with an assistant. Some offices do have assistants, and I have tried everything out there from Isolite and the offshoots of Isolite, pink metal, green leaf or red leaf, whatever. <laughs> I've tried everything, and I find I have to individualize it for the patient. But I tell people, whatever you normally use to Capitron a patient, that's what you would use. So my go-to truly is I've been the saliva injector, and I have the patient hold it. That's my, that's my go-to. Nicole, what's yours? Yeah, so I, I am a little spoiled when I have a long if the case scheduled. Uh, my doctor's um, wife comes in and she suctions for me. She was a dental assistant. Uh, nice. Yeah, she kind of she's uh, she's amazing. She's one of my favorite people, and she's you know she's the Ed McMahon to my Johnny Carson. So she kind of lightens up the mood a little bit. You guys don't know who that is. You're probably too young. We do. <laughs> They, I have had the patient hold it, um, especially if you're a gagger. They, they have a job and it distracts them. I've, I've curled it up. I do have an isolite, but I am all thumbs getting that thing in, and sometimes it doesn't work out because of that. But when it does, that's great. Uh, so just different options. But you don't need, like Francis said, whatever you normally would use, likely will be just fine. 
Okay. I was just curious because I'm getting used to isolate myself because I am in that aerosol world right now. So I'm trying very hard to <laughs> use my high volume, but I was just like, oh, okay, okay, wait a second. There's something in your left hand. There's something in your right hand. This is where I had a doctor tell me I'd be a better assistant if I had three hands and no ovaries once. <laughs> that was real fun. He was the best. He also had other things to say about that, but moving on, I digress as usual. So my other question is air powder. Are you doing those procedures with the um, endoscope? Definitely. I start with that. That's my number one thing I do. Uh, the more biofilm I can get out of there, the better my picture's going to see. The, I, 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 yes, that's my number one go-to is... Love it. Yeah, yeah. Nicole, how do you use it? I used to, that's right, I used to irrigate with with something, you know, a bleach solution, iodine, uh, peroxide, anything to try and get that out first. And now that I have have, uh, the air polisher at my disposal, I use that first as well. Get that, all that sticky biofilm out of there. I mean, I don't know why people don't have it in general in offices, because even when your patient comes back, it's the best thing to use to remove that biofilm that's built back up again, whether you're using it subgingivally or supra. It's right. a great tool, and I don't know why people, everybody out there, go buy them. Oh, yeah. And what we're saying is using like the glycine or erythritol with uh, not your sodium bicarbonate. You're not going subgingival with that. But uh, if you listen to this podcast enough, you've heard me talk about this. So, and there will be some more info coming out on the podcast soon. So stay tuned for that because we're going to talk about guided biofilm therapy with the EMS airflow one day. Guided biofilm. That was the term I was looking for. (laughs) Guided bio. So catchy, right? So, and I love to hear that you're recommending the ultrasonic because after taking Anna Pattison's course and watching her, use the scalers and knowing that we're all, we're touching significantly less tooth surface than we think with our curettes. Like we're going down there, like you said, explore, scale, explore, scale. Like you're going down there and you're doing such damage to that root surface. Like every time that you go down there without removing that calculus, because you're probably not on it. I mean, that's what I learned from Anna's course. Like you're probably not, especially if it's a spicule, you're probably not on it. And so I really love hearing that. And I just, and I'm envisioning how much less trauma, not only just from a surgical tissue standpoint, but how much less trauma we're creating for that tooth, that living viable tooth surface. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We're sparing them. We're only instrumenting where we need to. And we're, we can see how effective we are. I rely on my cavitron more than, but I'm not afraid to pick up a hand instrument. Uh, but it does give me a lesson in how much of that I'm actually engaging. They said the tip third when I was in school is more like the tip. Yes. Minis. You know, those minis and micro minis, those are the only things that really work. The other ones are way too big. big. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. I wanted to, one of the other things I have learned that I, I try and teach my students is probably the number one place, and Nicole can probably attest to this, that I find calculus. <sighs> what? I know it's down in the pocket, but the other place I find it is at the CEJ. Yes. Oh, right. <laughs> also, my students, make that ultrasonic. When you think you're done. I, I want to get to a patient so bad I can't stand it. Yes. Yep. <laughs> like, give me. Same here. Like, Oh, okay. (laughs) Yes. I use that active tip right along the entire root structure, you know, that whole thing from top to bottom, not just in the, you know. Lacey, on a scale of one to 10, how jealous are you? Oh, a 10. I would love to have this in the office. I'm like a a 1 million. (laughs) Yeah. I would love to have this in the office. (laughs) Do you have any final questions, Lacey? I had a question about furcations. Have you had any issues with that? It's wonderful in furcations. You can take that endoscope, shine it up into the floor of that furcation and see what's going on. You can't do that in, in flap surgery. I, I, right. 
I mean, you do it more probably imperial, but to me, imprecations, it is a, a definite. I mean, you need to have it. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. You can. You can see right what, what's happening on the roof of that imprecation, that roof of that cave. That, and you can't feel that when you're exploring and you, you can't see it during uh, flap surgery. You know, in all honesty, there have been a couple of times where I can see it and I just cannot get to it. And so that person did need to have a smaller flap just for the doctor. And I have to show him where it is to, for, to, for access um, be, just because of the nature of our instruments. But 99% of the time I am removing calculus that's on that the what i like to call the the ceiling or the roof of that that furca that's very cool yeah that's a good question question lacy anything else you could think of not at this time i don't think so i think you guys explained this so beautifully like these nerd highs after the podcast are <laughs> they're addicting <laughs> So if people have any questions or want to find out, want to see it, is there a YouTube or a website? Any thoughts on where they could go to check, take a look and see what this is that we're talking about? Yeah, yes, they can go to Orview. You know, if you, uh, there are, there are videos on YouTube of different people using them. And so, yes, you definitely can go to YouTube and see it. You can contact Orview. You can contact Zest be more than happy to help you answer questions, share information. There's a lot more we could say. (laughs) And if they have any questions for either of you, what's the best way to get those answered? Email email me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to email? I'm not too much (laughs) Yeah. What's your email? Give me your contact information. (laughs) <laughs> My contact information is Francis F R A N C E S dot. Uh, I had to think Tryon T R Y O N. Sorry, at orview dot us. Perfect. <laughs> People can reach me through email is always best, and it's um, Nicole at NicoleFortuneRDH dot com. No A for me. I see you, Ellie. Excellent. And I do appreciate you guys coming on and taking the time to give us your knowledge. And I am so jealous of your experiences. And I really think that there is going to be somebody that hears this and they're going to be like, I could do this. I could do this. This is what I've been waiting to hear. So thank you for this time tonight and today, whatever, whatever time zone you're in. (laughs) Thank you guys so much. (laughs) Awesome. So I would love to hear everybody's feedback. As mostly I want to know how many of you are immediately wanting to go out and buy an Indusco. Yeah, for like, sure. I want to hear how many people would just trip over getting one of these things. Yeah. It would be amazing. Yeah. We also want to thank PDT for giving uh, CE credit for this uh, through CE Zoom. Check out PDT. Um, ask your rep. They are the owners or creators of Montana Jack. And it, this is Breast Cancer Awareness, and they do have a month, I should say. They do have a Montana Jack that's pink, and I think uh, portions of that go to Breast Cancer Awareness. So definitely go get you a Montana Jack that's pink. Just, you know, why not? And if you haven't checked out the Dental Podcasting Network, we have Channel 1 and Channel 2. Really great shows going on over there, so make sure you head over there and subscribe to those ones. Tell your friends. Subscribe to this one also. If you're not a subscriber to this, hit the subscribe button. It's not that hard. Well, that's on iTunes. How does that work on other ones? It's the same thing. So when I add Correct. favors to, because mine is just a favorite oh. for Stitcher. Well, let's have that conversation right now as I open. So this. you can tell your friend, and tell your friends. So I'm on Podcast Addict. And I'm on Stitcher. Oh, that's Instagram. That's not the right one. Well, at least you know what it is. You can't uh, talk can't, about it, but at least of, you know what it is. Whatever. I kind of recognize it a little bit. So yeah, no, this one is as a, a subscribe to. And Stitcher is just the little plus sign add button. And then it will always update and let you know when a new one has come out, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And follow us on Instagram for sure, because we're going to start doing some really cool story, Insta stories and um, new segments there. And we have a a newsletter that you should definitely subscribe to so that you find out maybe some cool tidbits that me and Andrew are doing and uh, kind of a recap of the month before. So it's only once a month. Your inbox isn't getting bombarded. And our new website, though, you can search 
episodes. Maybe if you're looking for Teresa Duncan's tip episodes, like it'll all be there and the tip episodes are all together as well. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to throw this out there at the very, very end of our, I don't know if anyone actually listens this far. No. Oh. So what I would like to know, and actually I'm just going to throw this down. Okay. What? No, I'm just waiting. What no, I'm just going to say like, you know how much I hate doing videos. Yes, you do. A lot. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that if I don't hear back from a cert, any listener, just one, if you want me to do videos more, you need to email us. <laughs> okay. And if you do say yes, then maybe I will do more videos. But I think that people don't want to see my face. I don't want to see your face, so I can understand that's that. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's, and that's the general consensus, I think, of, of our audience listeners. So, Doubt it. Um, and also, Dad, you don't count on this. If you're, oh, yeah, your like, dad. Any family members are, are out, of, out of the running on this one. Like, this has to be a, a, a listener. A real listener. Real, real life listener. They're real listener. listeners. One of you guys that hits a, that subscribe button, please yeah. do that. Let me know about that. That'd be great. All right. Um, and definitely, um, in, you can email us those things at a tale of two hygienists at gmail.com, or you can do Michelle or Andrew at a tale of two hygienists.com, whatever works for you. Or you can go through our website. Anything else? I think that's it. I hope everyone has a great week. Yep. Bye y'all.